or the CGED, the CGED um, alongside the gender studies program uh, presents this online panel presentation in conjunction with the US Consulate General of Hong Kong and Macau. Um, this is to celebrate an exhibit uh, celebrating the 100th, um, well, nearly 101st anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. So the 100 years of women's suffrage in America exhibition will actually be open to visitors in the Hong Kong Humane Library uh, until the 28th of August. So for details, just check the website of the Hong Kong U Library. Signed into law on the 26th of August in 1920, the passage of the 19th Amendment extended the right to vote to women across the US. So the exhibits actually uh, took place um, um, late last year at the Chicago, University of Chicago UN campus. And then there was a rerun of that. And now we're presenting it here at the University of Hong Kong main library. The exhibits both highlight the work of several key individuals, as well as the struggle of countless others. The pa this panel discussion aims to complement and question the contents of the exhibit from a comparative, um, political, transnational, and multicultural perspectives. And I will be closing um, um, this session with a reflection and probably play a, a, an audio clip or two and after the panel discussion, Q&A. But to bring us to our discussion, the reason why we are here today is that there are potential questions and uh, reactions whenever, whenever we see exhibits or talks or features about the centennial of the women's suffrage movement. So one reaction I felt was uh, that, or, or a question that I, I had in my mind was, are there Asian, Latin, and Native American women in the movement that um, even seeing Black women um, cited in the history books, were there more uh, Black women who were written out of the history books or that their histories or that the things that they've done for the movement been revised? You know? And while reading some of the fine print, I could not find anything that relates to the queerness of some of the women and probably some of the men in the movement. So maybe they were codified, the queerness were codified into friendships, companionships, excusing the absence of the current queer lexicon. So to help me um, um, elucidate all of these uh, points to you and maybe bring about some more questions in the process, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. And it's such an honor for me to be sharing this uh, virtual stage with them. So first, we have Professor Louise Edwards, who is an Emeritus Professor of Chinese History at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. She publishes on women and gender in China and Asia, and her most recent books include Women Warriors and Wartime Spies in China, uh, Women Politics and Democracy, Women's Suffrage in China, and most recently, uh, Drawing Democratic um, Dreams in Republican China. So that was released last year. So I'll ask uh, our panelists to talk about their books later on as well. So that's Professor Louise Edwards. And we have Professor Martha S. Jones. And she is the Society of Black Alumni Pro uh, Presidential Professor, a professor of history and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She's a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the history of American democracy. Professor Jones is an accomplished author, and her latest landmark work is Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. That was released also last year, must read, uh, must read books for 2020. So I'll be asking our um, uh, panelists to talk about their works later on. But for now, welcome and thank you for joining us, Luis and Martha. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, because the word suffrage <laughs> is in our um, discussion, I would have to throw the first question to um, Louise, if she can actually guide us, you know, given the current social political situation of Hong Kong and uh, China, uh, how do we talk about suffrage, particularly women's rights and women's suffrage 
um, here in Hong Kong and in China? You've thrown me the, the hardest one first, but I'll, I'll, I'll grab it by the <laughs> horns and go for it. One of the things that I think that will become apparent over the course of this um, uh, hour that we share together is that um, we'll see that participation in whatever political system you have is really important. And um, you've got to leverage whatever, and if it's a fraught political situation where well, you've got to leverage whatever personal power, money, security, whether it be your citizenship or your, um, your educational status, you've got to leverage that to speak for people who don't have the opportunities that you have. And the other thing I think that you, and you'll see this through the history of the uh, women's suffrage movement um, in the, the US um, and also throughout, throughout the Asian region. I guess the other thing that um, it's really important to keep in mind is that a lot of really good struggles um, have a very long arc of history and it's important not to give up. And it's important to know that what you do, there'll be people that follow you. And there's multiple generations of women who struggled um, uh, around the world to win their, their right to vote and stand for election and their daughters join them and their granddaughters join them so it's a it's a long project but if you know where you're going you've got um you've got uh you, you, you'll have the energy and you'll keep the momentum going and then two more things on that on that issue around um around the, the current situation is it's really important to keep celebrating the histories of people who have waged peaceful struggles for noble causes, because it's really easy for governments or power holders within institutions to silence those stories because they don't want anything to change. So it's important for us to do these kinds of events, to hold these kinds of exhibits so that the stories of people who did wage peaceful, peaceful struggle can actually be celebrated. And then the last point I think I'd say is really celebrate democracy within your own institutions and within your own families and within your own community groups, because it's only by everyday practice of really allowing people to speak and to genuinely listening to what they are saying and then acting in a consensus way that we can move forward. It's the everyday practice of democracy, wherever it is in your world is really important. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Louise. And so that's why I think we can really navigate this discussion well. And I think after our panel discussion, this gives us also an opportunity um, to talk about um, women's suffrage and the role that women played in different parts of the world, you know, from a historical uh, perspective in our classrooms or in our webinars. So thank you for that, Louise. And um, my next question is for the both of you, um, because we've been hearing the word suffragist and suffragette. But then maybe for some people, there are some nuances or some you know, differences and that some would insist that you're not supposed to use the words interchangeably or that it's probably okay. So um, for both of you, what does suffragist, uh, suffragette and suffragist mean? Well, um, I can jump in um, yes. and just let me start by saying um, thanks so much to you, Brenda. It's an honor to be here. Um, with everybody at the University of Hong Kong um, and, and obviously an honor to be here with Louise. So thank you so much for including me um, today. I will speak from the US perspective where um, the term you use does matter. Um, suffragist versus suffragette, um, these terms had distinct meanings. Um, during the course of the movement for women's votes in the United States, um, even as um, it was a movement that had links to other places, including um, the UK. Um, in the US, um, uh, advocates for women's votes very deliberately took up the term suffragist, um, but um, they were um, by their critics and by their opponents, um, oftentimes termed suffragettes. This was a borrowing from the British context in which um, suffragette had been the term that denoted um, more radical factions of the women's suffrage movement. But in the US, it's the, um, it's the um, suffragette, the et, and suffragette, the diminutive, um, that was intended to brand um, suffrage advocates as um, uh, less than serious, less than, uh, less than um, formidable, um, less than women, um, and certainly less than men. Um, so in US parlance, um, we consider suffragette um, 
a pejorative, but it's not true everywhere. Um, I, I don't have a huge amount to say on this, particularly from the point of view of many Asian nations. They weren't using English, so they were translating their own terms into um, uh, their own, uh, making it work in their own languages. And for example, in Chinese, the, the term became much more women's participation in politics. So it was a kind of strung together and that that um, that operated in a fairly neutral term, except that all of these women were considered extremely radical, <laughs> regardless of um, how they were labeled because they were uh, they were trying to upset uh, traditional power, power hierarchies. Thank you. Actually, in the in the UK uh, as well, they were very particular with using the word, uh, at least around that time. So that's uh, the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, so for just would uh, be referred to the more pacifist uh, women who were fighting for their rights to vote. And suffragettes was actually used like an insult hurled against the more militant um, um, women. Yeah, so they are actually in the Philippines, I tend to read the word suffragette. Uh, tend to be used more to refer to um, the, the early leaders of the, the women's rights uh, uh, to vote movement. So speaking of that, women's rights to vote, my next question to the both of you is, what, why were women denied the, the, the right to vote? And what drove women in America for Martha and then in China for Louise you know, to actually fight for their rights to be heard? Martha? Oh, sure. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that enormous question. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, but I think one way to tell the story in the US um, is to recognize that um, in a nation that is, you know, founded out of many political traditions, um, there is a point of departure at the end of the 18th century, the American Revolution, um, a, uh, eventually a US constitution that we're still governed by um, with its amendments, including the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment today, um, that even in those founding moments at the end of the 18th century, they're all already um, open and important debates about um, the relationship of women to the body politic. And I love the way in which Louise sort of translated that to us into a, a much more, frankly, um, uh, ambitious phrasing, right? About women's relations to politics. Voting is one dimension of that. But even in the late 18th century, American women are um, debating their relationship to political culture more generally. And in fact, there are small numbers of American women who do vote in the United States um, until the beginning of the 19th century, women in the state of New Jersey, for example, who are disenfranchised, um, along with all Black Americans, men and women in many states, when um, the word white um, comes into the constitutional lexicon and um, being a white person, a so-called white person becomes a criteria for voting rights. Um, so we are at the beginning of the 19th century in a debate that is yes about the vote, um, but it is about women in many spheres of public life um, and broad questions about how women can be in the context, yes, um, of political rights, but in terms of the economy, um, in terms of religious life and institutions like churches. Um, and so this is a debate um, out of which um, our very pointed questions about women's suffrage emerges. Now, why do people not want women to vote? Wow, um, <laughs> you know, we can point to lots of things. It's important to say power. Right, that um, voting and the capacity to vote um, is reserved to the few in the early United States. And that is um, one manifestation of a, a, a grab for power um, by a few over many. Um, but it is also true um, that um, some women, um, particularly white middle-class women um, are perceived to be um, too fragile, um, too frivolous, 
um, and more, right, in their demeanors, in their countenance, um, in their capacities um, to be independent voters. Women in the United States are subject to um, uh, the legal dominion of their husbands. Um, and for Black American women, and the, these are the women about whom I write, um, there is the additional um, objection, which is that um, their status as enslaved people or formerly enslaved people in the United States, their blackness, their race, racism um, becomes a deep rationale for keeping many American women for the poll, from the polls for um, a long time. So I know we're gonna get to talk more um, about that story, um, but I think I, what I hope um, in this short sort of, you know, peek at the question is that, you know, I think today we can recognize right, that some of the kinds of arguments that were made about keeping women from the polls are still with us um, in many democracies. Um, and they, you know, they um, uh, surface um, when we have prominent women candidates, um, when women exert important influence at the polls. And so um, while we've traveled a long distance, I think sometimes the debates in the US of the 19th century are um, all too familiar, even in the 21st. Yeah, and I think um, like bringing in a perspective from uh, the, the vast stretch of lands and countries that uh, Asia comprises, uh, you know, for the, for a lot of the uh, previous two centuries to the 20th century, you know, there were there were no democracies in Asia. They were either monarchies or they were sort of fiefdoms. Uh, people were subjects rather than citizens. And then they then they were colonized by you know France or Britain or the Dutch or the Spanish. And so there was this sense that nobody was a citizen, not even the men. And then as part of that movement to uh, regain independence from the colonial powers, the men needed support from everybody. And so they sort of, you know, the women got on board and the women are saying, well, you know, if we're gonna overthrow the Dutch or the French, you know, we're people too. You want us now? We, we, we want e equality as citizens and the new democracies that you're claiming that you will form after we overthrow the French or we overthrow the Dutch. And so what we have, what we saw happening um, uh, through most of Asia was people, women were able to hitch their wagon for more rights to the nationalist struggle. And that gave them really unique and very powerful speaking positions. Now, it didn't always work out for the best. Uh, for example, um, once China overthrew its um, monarchy, the Qing dynasty, the men in power and the women had been there, you know, making bombs, throwing bombs, you know, doing the lobbying, all sorts of things. They'd done every part of the, the, the movement to overthrow the Qing. But when they... Uh, established the Republic, the men said, well, you know, now that we're, we've got it, you know, why don't you guys go back and get, you women go back and get educated, and then we'll think about giving you the vote. Now, this, of course, was uh, highly, highly annoying to all of these women who thought that they were fighting for their rights as well as for the nation. Uh, so the men say, why did they not want uh, the, the, the women to have the vote? Well, they kind of had this idea that um, uh, the new nation was going to be a moral nation and a good virtuous moral nation was one in which women uh, were in the home and were modest and virtuous and didn't speak out, didn't take the public public stage. And so the, the men were thinking, well, we want our nation to be a good nation. So the women should go back into the home because that's what makes a good nation. And so they did a lot of stuff that, um, that then, uh, really enraged you know they had a they had a vision of uh, had a vision of a good stable society that was founded on real standard um divisions of public and private um uh, being male and female uh what else was there um the the other thing that the, why did women want to go into into the voting arena i think they wanted to go in because as a result of the engagement with this western idea of democracy and independent nationhood that they were all absorbing as part of colonialism or as part of the imperial engagement and, and general awareness, is they really wanted to have that sense of um, technical and um, industrial, you know, global skills, medical skills. They wanted an education that included all of those things. And you couldn't get that within the domestic sphere. So a lot of the women started lobbying for a different type of education than they'd normally been given. And they could do that because it's going to build the nation. And many of the reformist men that they were working with 
also believed that as well. So they they could say, okay, we need everybody to become, you know, as many people as possible to become medical doctors or as many people as possible to become engineers and lawyers because we need to combat these foreigners who are trying to take over our country. So finding that sense of unity against foreigners was really important. Um, and, you know, and, and women wanted access to money. They were sick of watching their brothers get the inheritance and them get nothing. They wanted access to employment and security. So it was just gradually, you know, this, this awakening. And uh, that, yeah, that's pretty much what the men didn't want them to have. And I think Martha's point is correct. Sure. It comes down to, you keep put, comes you keep down to power. And half will have the love. I Hi, Jasmine, you need time. to turn your your audio off. Um, yeah, so the, the men, you can tell that women, you can tell that political power is something uh, valuable and suffrage is something valuable when you've got so many people trying to stop some particular groups from having it. You know, that's how you know we have to maintain it. That's how you know we have to expand the franchise. Thank you. That's very extensive, um, Louise and Martha. Thank you so much. And um, you mentioned, you, you talked about the men, you know, around that time, you know, being probably playing the usual antagonistic roles, but were there actual um, allies um, uh, in the women's movement? Um, so I would be directing a question to Martha, if, she, if you could actually dissect um, the role of Frederick Douglass in the movement. And were there other men like Frederick Douglass around that time who helped women, particularly Black women, to be included in the in the collective voice? Yes, um, you know Douglass is um, probably best remembered um, of the early allies to uh, women's rights advocates and women's suffragists. Um, Douglass himself is a formerly enslaved man um, now. Um, by the 1840s, a, um, an abolitionist orator, writer, journalist of great reputation. Um, and he, um, because of the um, intersections created by the anti-slavery movement, um, has become um, not only um, an ally to, but a compatriot um, with many American women um, who are also beginning to speak about their own rights. Douglas is very um, famously remembered for being at what was a small but well-remembered women's uh, meeting in uh, Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Um, um, he is the sole African-American um, on record at that meeting, um, but he importantly, um, allies himself with the proponents of um, a facet of that declaration of sentiments that results in that meeting. Um, he is an important and key figure in supporting the claim um, that uh, women should, among other things, have the vote. Um, but it's an awkward moment, um, isn't it? Because um, there are no African-American women um, at Seneca Falls um, on record, um, contributing to the construction of that declaration. Um, and so, um, in fact, while Douglas is important, um, we still have to look elsewhere um, for other, yes, African-American men who will be allies to this movement, but we might ask where are black women in this moment? Um, and they are elsewhere, for example, in um, African-American Protestant churches um, where they are organizing uh, to claim rights, um, including the right to have preaching licenses, to exercise authority within their religious communities. Um, so Douglas's presence um, tells us something about him, but it also permits us to see that even in these early decades, black and white women are organizing in very distinct ways in the United States, even as they're all thinking about the question of their rights. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, there were definitely male allies in uh, helping the women in uh, China and many parts of Asia as well. But if I could just give you a couple of examples in China, the, um, you know, the, the women faced, uh, the women who stood up and said they wanted a public role in public life faced a lot of attacks, personal attacks. So they, the, the media would smear them. They would be humiliated in public. They would, 
uh, you know, there were stories about them all being, you know, there was the classic slut shaming, you know, these women, they're just sleeping with everybody and they would be printed in the newspaper. So rather than be considered a, um, a loose woman, they would do things like go and trash the offices of the newspaper that, um, you know, that, that had spread the smear because it was better to be considered a vandal than it was to be considered a loose woman. They would do things like depict cartoons of these women, one, one in particular, a newspaper published a story about this suffragist who was sitting on the on the toilet, you know, a, a, a commode, a little um, a, a, talking to the male parliamentarians while she picked zits on her face and did her toenails and was shitting into the bowl. And this was the idea. These women are not really good women. And these women are disgusting, revolting creatures. And that's the type of woman that wants to get into parliament. Now, in, the, in contrast to that, there were a whole lot of men a lot of them were brothers um, and younger colleagues, fellow students who were supporting these women through these kinds of really public shaming, public smearing. And they, they were uh, there supporting them through uh, providing school fees, providing them with safe houses when they were wanting to move schools or uh, providing them with um, moral support, writing um, articles supporting these women, um, sometimes pretending to be women writing articles, you know, like it was, it took a whole community. And the other, so allies are really important in whatever movement. Some of the allies you're not gonna like, you're not gonna like the whole package they bring with their agenda, but it becomes keeping your eye on the long ball is really important. The other group of allies that's really interesting in, um, in Asia is uh, the Eurasian communities, right? So in places like Indonesia, where you had extensive uh, Dutch, uh, decades of Dutch colonialism, you had large populations of people who were considered European because they were children of Dutch, white Dutch men. And so they had some sort of status as Europeans, but were mixed race. And these people became really important allies for Indonesian, Indonesian women, as well as for other Eurasian women, the men in the Eurasian community. So you had these kind of crossover people who also supported the movement, but yeah, allies are really, really crucial. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, I have a follow-up question. You were talking about, going back to China. Um, so when you were talking about um, how Chinese women, you know, those who were very um, um, valiant in fighting for their rights to be heard, and then a lot of um, insults were hurled at them. Um, did the situation in China, particularly um, women who whose feet were bound. And then I don't know if um, you've heard also of the leftover women, right? Mm. If it's already um, um, a culture around that time. Did these practices exacerbate the situations of women? And how did that contrast with the time wherein women were actually invited to join the workforce already in the period of the industrialization of China? Yeah, the big campaigns around uh, stopping foot binding were kind of the late 1800s so they coincided very much with the movement for women's rights generally um, so th there was no separation of the movement usually the suffragists were already their feet were not bound uh, they, they'd already been the generation that had uh, you know not bound their feet and that that uh, that sort of battle was being it was was kind of already won in the among the urban women who were mobilizing for the vote and uh yeah, so uh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's all I can say on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and can you also clarify the, your entry in the Pacific Islander um, um, volume about the year when suffrage really started in China? Uh, I think you were trying to clarify if it's 1947 or 1949, so. Oh yeah, well, um, that, that article in Pacific Historical Review, uh, what I was trying to say was that uh, it's actually not a great practice among history writers to say, oh, this is the year that women got the vote, because I think, as Martha has already said, it's a long struggle and people were voting in different constituencies well before, you know, 1920 in the US, there was already an active democracy. We, we kind of have a year so that we have something to celebrate. But in the case of China, um, the year that is often considered to be the year that women got um, the vote is 1949 when the Communist Party said, you know, all in their constitution that uh, men and women are, uh, are equal in the People's Republic of China. But that has really hidden the whole history of 
previous constitutions in China and previous voting practices and previous um, electoral systems, both at the provincial level uh, and also at the national level. So you could say Chinese women already had the legal right to vote in 1936 because a constitution from the nationalist government was a draft constitution and that allowed um, women to participate in all sorts of politics and elections during the course of the war against Japan. And then it was became a formal constitution in 1937. But I think that the main point I was trying to make was that a year is important, but it's it, it hides a lot of other stuff that uh, makes us feel like there's only one point of victory. So um, Martha's got something to say here too. Yeah, if I could, thanks, yes. Louise, because I just want to um, piggyback yes. on your comment. Um, it, folks, I think, may know that we've just finished in the U.S. a year marking the centennial of women's votes. But as I've alluded to, there are American women who vote um, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, many American women, particularly in the Western states, are voting um, in the 19th century. Um, and of course, African-American women um, and other women of color in the United States are not going to, many of them, win the vote in 1920 and will wait, um, or more to say, they will press until um, 1965. Um, when the US Congress enacts a Voting Rights Act um, that overrides um, the um, laws, um, intimidation and violence that had kept so many women and men from voting in the United States. And so I think your point is such an important one, Louise, that um, while um, commemorative years give us the opportunity um, to do a lot of teaching um, and um, they generate a lot of interest in our subjects. Um, we spend a lot of time then disabusing people of the assumption, right, that um, the entire story can be pegged to a given anniversary year. And so I think that part of what we've done, um, you know, in this year, year and a half now that we've been on this subject with such focus is to help folks rethink the kind of timelines um, and the kinds of easy assumptions. You know, there are many American women, uh, not only women of color, who do not get the vote in 1920, if you are deemed uh, mentally incompetent, if you are not a citizen of the United States, if you marry a non-US national um, and you're an American woman in 1920, you are denaturalized, you lose your citizenship and you cannot vote. Um, so these are important, I think, for um, the degree especially that we want to draw lessons from these struggles, that there is no magic bullet or fell swoop or moment when um, the skies open, um, but these are ongoing struggles and we have these milestone moments, um, but they don't tell the whole story. Yes. And when you're talking about um, some other women who were not allowed to vote, um, I think one historical figure who resonates with me is uh, Mabel Pinghua Lee, who even if she has been, uh, because she's a, uh, um, a woman of Chinese, um, um, she was born in China, but she moved to the US and eventually she became educated in the US and she joined um, the suffrage, women's suffrage movement. But unfortunately there was this Chinese Exclusion Act. And I, I think that, that, that prevented her to, to still vote in spite of the 19th amendment, right? Absolutely. So yeah, and this, she's not a citizen of the United States. She can't be a citizen of the United States. Um, yeah. And as a result, she is functionally disenfranchised despite the fact that we have a constitutional amendment um, that gives the appearance that women have been guaranteed the vote. And, and this leads us um, uh, to ask you to tell us more about um, your book, Vanguard, because I was I, I, I was very interested also in four particular uh, women, you know, um, okay. Sojourner Truth, Sojourner Truth, you know, and uh, the, the fiction or the, the, the understanding of the her uh, landmark um, speech um, and Ida B. Wells and what the role that she played in the role in Washington, uh, the, the, the march in Washington were in, well, you can talk about that. Shirley Chisholm, I think she's very important um, because uh, I think she is one of the first women to become, uh, uh, to, to have a seat in Congress and uh, Charlotte Bass, who I think mm -hmm. is uh, the first woman to actually run for vice president. So 
Yes. Yeah. So talk about talk to us about Vanguard. Oh, that's an amazing um, pantheon of women that take us through a lot of time. Um, but importantly, um, Vanguard was a book I wrote because we were coming up on the centennial of the so-called women's suffrage amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 2020. Um, and I sensed that there was um, a danger that we might overlook the very women who you have just held up as emblematic of one important facet of this story. Um, and the arc that you've drawn goes from Sojourner Truth, um, born at the end of the 18th century enslaved in upstate New York, um, becomes an anti-slavery activist, a woman's rights advocate and more, um, and ends with um, Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman in 1968 to be um, elected to the US Congress from Brooklyn, New York. Um, there's probably a New York story in there for another time. Um, but um, it's to say that when we look at the arc of those women's lives, what we, among the things we should recognize is that when we put the focus or we put black women at the center of the story of voting rights in the United States, it is no longer a story that goes from that meeting in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 to 1920 with ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, now we have to reach back to understand someone like Sojourner Truth and how her ideas, um, her criticism of both racism and sexism um, grows out of her years of enslavement, um, the politics of anti-slavery and more um, that is not um, that precedes a meeting like that in Seneca Falls. Um, and then someone like Shirley Chisholm, um, whose um, ascent in American politics is attributable, um, again, not to the 19th Amendment in 1920, but the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So this is the way in which when we center Black women, and this is really the purpose of Vanguard, um, we discover a different kind of story. You asked about um, um, Ida Wells um, and um, Charlotta Bass. Well, um, I mean, Wells' story again could take us, you know, an entire um, summer. Um, but importantly, Wells is someone who points us to the ways in which Black American women are organizing around suffrage, but they're not doing that within suffrage associations. Right? Wells is founding um, Black women's uh, suffrage associations in the city of Chicago. Um, she is um, among the women leading the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which is probably as close as we get to a women's suffrage organization among African-American women. But Wells is best remembered as having been an anti-lynching advocate, which tells us something about the multiplicities of Black women's politics. Never is someone like Wells a single issue advocate at all. Charlotta Bass, and then I'll pass it to Louise. Um, Charlotta Bass was a discovery for many Americans when in August of 2020, Kamala Harris accepted the Democratic nomination. She was gonna run for vice president alongside Joe Biden. And commentators um, mistakenly dubbed her um, the first black woman to run for black vice president of the United States. Not so fast because Charlotta Bass um, who had begun her professional life in Los Angeles and California. She was a journalist, the owner of um, the California Eagle, a very important um, newspaper of the 20th century. Um, Bass becomes um, drawn into American politics, but to dissident politics, to left politics, to um, Communist Party politics. Um, and she will run in 1951 for the vice presidency um, uh, as on the progressive party ticket. And that is a reminder, right, that um, women's suffrage is not simply about mainstream uh, political parties, right, and, the, and, the, and the, the conventions of those kinds of spaces, that there are American women who are stretching and participating in a broadest, the broadest sense of what politics means and what politics should do. Um, and while Bass doesn't win, um, she is certainly that woman who breaks um, the glass ceiling for Black women when it comes to running um, for major party offices.
Thank you. Thank you for that, Martha Jones. And of course, don't forget Vanguard is uh, already out and hopefully we would have a, we'll check if we have a copy here in the Hong Kong U Library. Uh, so thank you, Martha. And Louise, can you talk about drawing the democratic dreams in the Rep uh, Republican China? Sure, this was a, a, a book that um, uh, looked at the way that uh, a group of commercial artists who were trying to promote uh, democratic values in the 1910s through to about 1925 among a broader population in China tried to encourage people to think in more democratic ways, to think in less hierarchical ways, to think um, uh, more uh, organically about how they could interact with the state. So taking subjects imperial subjects and turning them into citizens was not just something that you could do overnight. And so these people were participating in that. And of course, one of the ways to do that was to um, was to use pictures of beautiful women to get people to read the um, articles, to look at the um, uh, to look at the images. So it was kind of like using sex to sell democracy. Um, <laughs> you're looking pretty horrified at this. But, you know, again, politics is not pure. Right, you have a big goal, and you're going to, um, you know, advance your cause in multiple ways. But I think the other, the, the multiplicity of the struggles that Martha um, showed that the women in in her book Vanguard um, were involved in tells us about the really fundamental issues that these women uh, and their allies and their that wherever they were uh, were really dedicated to, and it, and the fact that it. Um, it comes as a package. So when you start challenging the gender distinctions between voting rights and who has power based on gender, you're also challenging race hierarchies, class hierarchies, geographic hierarchies, language hierarchies, religious hierarchies. And that's where you know, women's suffrage is just one component of an overall much bigger curve of history in which different types of marginalized voices are actually being able to conceive of themselves as people who should have you know the rights that that other people have that they should share in the power that they should share in making the legend the rules that they're going to be living under you know, you know the, the, if they're going to be a rule about inheritance rights you know why shouldn't the people who were going to be you know disinherited have a right to to say something about that so it's you know it's important to to recognize that complexity of of of, um, of story, and I think the the other thing that's really important um, with books like Vanguard is by filling in stories that we don't know about the suffrage movement that are actually a little bit outside of the mainstream triumphalist narrative that a given particular government or a particular type of government wants to tell us and put through the education system, we come to appreciate the, the real threat that women's suffrage pose to structures because of this bigger picture that it, that it, that it also challenged. Um, one of the things that we see um, in suffrage history um, for a long time was the idea that, oh, these were just elite women, they were all educated, they were upper class and they didn't really speak for the ordinary for the ordinary women. So therefore, let's not study them or let's, um, you know, like disregard their contributions. This is a classic Marxist critique of suffrage, you know, and that it was happening very much in China and and um, and also in the Soviet Union. I, these women, they weren't really fighting for you. Uh, trust us. We're the Communist Party. We, we'll fight for you working women. And so we can disregard them. Mm, this was not necessarily true, but this is the story. Um, the other uh, thing you can say that they, they were disregard, um, disregarded because of the, the fact that they weren't really good women. These were bad women and you didn't want to follow them. Um, so there's a lot of efforts taken in the way that suffrage history is told to prevent other groups who are marginalized now from getting inspiration from the complexity and diversity of the women's suffrage movement you know it's a it, you, if you you control that history you control the current status quo of power power base at the moment so democratic countries love to talk about the histories of the women's suffrage movement that got them to where they are in their perfect democracy today or their so-called perfect democracy today new zealand australia we've got lots of statues of these women who created the democracy of the day they've been contained by this by this story and what we can do by actually showing the diversity, the complexity, the, the not so nice parts of the story is that we can show how political struggle can create social change. 
And that's what we need to kind of learn. It's a long picture. We need to really be active in all sorts of spheres and, and take inspiration from a really messy suffrage, women's suffrage history. Thank you for that, Louise. And um, there's a question here for both of you. This is from Gina. So what do you think are the biggest challenges facing women still struggling for suffrage and political rights today? So in the US, Martha, and in Asia, Louise. <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much for um, the question, Gina. Um, you know, in the U.S. today, um, we are um, facing a resurgence of um, what we've referred to as voter suppression laws um, that are tragically, in my view, reminiscent of um, the laws that plagued um, women of color, particularly Black women, 100 years ago. Um, 100 years ago, um, Black American women faced laws that never said forthrightly Black women cannot or will not vote, but were designed through literacy tests, um, through poll taxes, um, through other barriers to the polls were designed deliberately um, to keep Black women from the polls. Um, now, there was an extraordinary um, social, political, and legal revolution in the United States, the civil rights movement, um, that looked to topple um, those laws and to, um, in many senses, for the first time, um, bring democracy, uh, a, a thoroughgoing democracy to the United States when it comes to political rights. Um, but here, um, again, in the 21st century, we are watching as individual states um, are enacting laws that are um, tragically reminiscent of laws that kept um, Black American women and many others from the polls 100 years ago. Um, so it is very much to Louise's point um, about um, the long struggle for voting rights. Um, I would say in US history, um, voting rights have always been accompanied by voter suppression. We have no golden age of voting rights in the United States, no golden age of democracy, um, that access to the polls, access to the ballot, access to office holding have been and continue to be um, a struggle. Um, and we pass on both the aspirations um, of um, what universal political rights can mean for a democracy. Um, at the same time, we pass on to next generations lessons, one um, of those um, very, same, um, very same struggles. And I think if um, I was to follow on from that, I would say um, one of the biggest challenges we face today in the Asia Pacific region is the rise of the big man politics, where people in times of crisis are really, you know, like lured by the strong talking big man. And this is really, really dangerous because these are often uh, megalomaniacs who are, you know, who are not going to do do what's right for the bulk of the population, but they look credible on the, you know, on the Twitter or they look credible on some sort of, uh, you know, t television snap. And we see that democracy is really under threat all around the Asia Pacific region, uh, Myanmar, Thailand. You know, these are these are now back in the hands of military strongmen. In Australia, we see a military guy stand up every day and give us a COVID health. Thing. I mean, this is a health crisis, not a military crisis, but people are kind of drawn, it seems, to a big man, strong, strong man type of appearance of politics. And this is one of the things I think that the, the women's suffrage history tells us is that there are different ways of being a democratic system. There are different ways of managing your societies and that we need to really, you know, work towards these more collaborative, more inclusive types of democracies. The other thing I think that's really interesting is the way that quotas for different marginalized groups, including women, are disregarded around the um, many parts of the world. And we see that, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, political parties will say, oh, you've got the right to vote, you've got access to politics, all equal, it's all, you know, what's your problem? It's a meritocracy. If you're good enough, you'll make it. So we don't need quotas. You know, 
that's the you know then then the process has become one of well we won't pre-select women for these seats you know we'll only get we'll let women take on the the seats when nobody thinks they can win the election you know this this kind of um bureaucratic stymieing of women's progress is really endemic throughout very active democracies japan australia um we see it very very commonly um the other challenge I think for the future is that we've really got to start looking at extending the rights that women, the bureaucratic and legislative rights that women won to other groups, uh, LBGTQI rights. Uh, marriage equality is still uh, an issue all around the Asia Pacific region and many other parts of the world. Indigenous people's rights, ethnic minorities' rights, these are you know, under threat on a regular basis. And there are many lessons we can learn from the struggles that women took and waged and you know really focused on over many decades to get and then i know this is going to sound a little bit loopy but i really think we need to start thinking about the planet as having rights and the latest ipcc report tells us that as human beings even though the planet is not speaking to us you know verbally or having a protest little sign we need to really start looking at the planet as having its own rights and speaking on behalf of that of that planet, if not nothing else, for our own our own safety and security into the future. That's my mad woman comment. <laughs> um, Lu, Lu, yeah, Lu, Luis, there's a follow up question that I'll address to you. So, um, women's suffrage movement is significant for democracy. My concerns go to definitions of democracy and communist party compared with that claimed in the U.S. Yeah, there's whole whole books written on this because you know we've got the democratic people's republic of korea where you know there's clearly not much democracy going on and in fact a lot of really authoritarian regimes will put democracy in their title it's almost like they think that's going to make it work um unless people can freely speak freely move freely um i i think voting is important um i know a lot of people say oh it's a waste of time but you know i i think voting is a crucial part of being democratic unless you have all the freedoms to do those kind of things then you can't really claim to be democratic now that doesn't mean that uh there are no you know that that once you've said once you've got free movement of people freedom of speech freedom of election that that then gives you the right to not examine your own democracy we see rising inequality all around the world and i think that's a feature of the fact that large corporations can pretty much buy off our democratic processes that's a major weakness you know and it, it's it, it's important for democracies to critique themselves rather than just say oh we're dem democracy and we're going to export our our fabulous model to everywhere else and you know there are many good things about the way that um, uh, places that don't have votes uh, look after their populations compared to those that do have votes that ignore their populations. So, yeah, thank you, Martha. Um, you may have touched on this subject, uh, being an ally, but uh, how can people of color who are also part of the LGBTQI plus community join in or be aligned with what women are fighting for, for voting and for equal rights. And uh, topple that big man politics. Um, it's important to say, you know, that I think that um, queer women have always been a part of the movement for um, women's suffrage and women's rights in the United States. Um, I write in Vanguard about um, the remarkable Pauli Murray, um, who goes from being um, a sort of dissident um, activist in the United States in the early 20th century um, to becoming an ordained minister um, later in the century toward the end of her life. Um, but in between um, is someone who wrestles um, uh, deeply um, with her gender identity, with her sexual identity, um, and is responsible in many ways in the United States for laying the foundation of a, um, a philosophical view um, that we come to call intersectionality. Um, and so um, uh, for me, at least, I think that um, it's important not to posit these as um, either or, um, but um, really as um, intersecting movements in important ways. And I'm not sure if you're hearing me. I apologize. Thank you, Martha. Yes, 
Yes, we, uh, we got that. Thank you for that. And then um, our last, I, I'll just call on Elizabeth Lacouture, who is the head of our gender studies program for the last question. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, hello, Professor Edwards. Nice to see you. And um, nice to meet you, um, Professor Jones. Really grateful, um, grateful to have you here. Um, virtually. So um, I'm a historian, so I kind of want to pull it back to history a bit. And um, I'm also really excited to see that this is a conversation that history can be relevant to a conversation, a very presentist conversation. But I want to kind of bring it back to the past and see if you two can kind of tie together what you've been talking about. Um, I think what we've done, I, I wanna think about the significance of the US consulate having this kind of exhibition in Asia, in Hong Kong, right? And um, I really appreciate the ways in which Professor Jones has complicated the history of suffrage um, in the US, um, while also showing, you know, this was a fraught movement that women had to fight for, but even the, the sort of triumphal narrative that we see in so many of these commemorative exhibitions is also just part, part of the part of the story. Um, and so, what I'm interested in, though, is how this 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 kind of story of women's political rights, which was so fraught and contested in the U.S., becomes the yardstick through which the U.S. measures other countries of the world, right? And then um, Professor Edwards at the beginning kind of touched a bit upon that yardstick story, right? How female political participation becomes something that really ignites the feminist movement and the sort of anti-Qing movement in China. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you two could kind of tie together what you've been talking about by considering how female political rights and citizenships becomes a almost an imperialist yardstick in the United States and then what it means when that gets carried over to other places but also what are the other possibilities for histories that are going beyond below this narrative thank you I can dive in first it's a big question um one of the things that uh we see um, we see happening um, with the yardstick model is that it worked both ways, and this was the power of a truly global movement. So women in China were saying, "Look at those women in America; they've got the vote. If you want to be a strong country like America, you have to give us the vote too." Women in America got the dates and a little bit the information a little bit wrong and said in 1912 to their, their, their men, look at those women in China, they've got the vote and they're standing in parliament, which they were in Guangdong province. And so both sides can use this kind of public shaming to advance a cause. And as I see what, I think that's what's happening with the global climate change um, movement at the moment. We're seeing that stage of using these things as ladders of progress and um, ladders of um, degrees of morality. Now that works really well, except when um, we're in situations like we are today with Afghanistan or in Xinjiang, where we see, um, you know, basically a bunch of men who couldn't give two, two hoots about women's rights, suddenly using women's rights as a justification for all sorts of obscene behavior or hypocritical actions and or using it to foment war. And that's that's the real danger with these kinds of, um, uh, when, when a particular, thing like women's rights becomes an icon it can then be used for all sorts of nefarious purposes nothing much we can do about that except except expose it or call it to account okay so if you're really concerned about afghani women then what are you going to do about it rather than you know just prat on about it um so th there's that that kind of um kind of issue is that oh i don't know martha can you rescue me <laughs> 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 uh, hardly, uh, you don't need rescuing, but I'm happy um, to come in. Um, and I think I would just add this um, layer. Um, one of the tensions, I think that one of the ways we could characterize the tension in Elizabeth's question, right, is that tension between um, history, 
um, as we practice it, as we write it, as we come to know it, um, and mythology, right? And, um, and it is oftentimes it is the mythologizing of the past that becomes the political instrument in the way that I think you intended to describe it, Elizabeth. The layer I'll add is that um, in my work, especially as I moved away from the women of the 19th and the early 20th century and full into the 20th century, American women are um, myth makers um, in their own right, that they understand that politics moves and the world moves. Um, oftentimes as much, if not more so, by the power of myth, um, by the power of partial truth. Um, and one of my struggles in, in writing this book was doing that historian thing, which is taking on a myth and dismantling it in every way, and then putting the pieces back together. And what that approach really didn't appreciate is that in order to be politicians, if I could use that word, American women had to become myth makers about themselves, um, about their histories, about how they got there, about where they were going. Um, and um, so I'm still wrestling with that, frankly, um, which is to say, on the one hand, that, Im that important intervention, which is to um, get beyond right, the gloss and the easy um, thread that permits then political leaders to mobilize women's rights for their own interests on the one hand, and then to appreciate that Women themselves, as they enter politics, participate in that um, very deliberately, very self-consciously, such that some of them, I write about Florida's Mary McLeod Bethune, and Bethune is an educator, a suffragist, and a great deal more, but Bethune it, it, it trades in powerful myths about herself all throughout her career. Um, she couldn't have done what she did if she didn't tell those stories, invent those stories, and um, and I'm not sure I did her justice by trying to take them apart. Um, but, you know, politics is, um, is hardly a pure endeavor, right? I think, you know, Louise has been trying to underscore that throughout her comments. Um, and what happens to women when they are fully immersed um, in the culture of politics as well as the mechanics of politics. And part of it is um, we begin to promote our own myths. And we have been doing that right through this centennial, I think, um, telling many myths, some of them even contradicting one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha and Louise. So um, after all of these um, learning from our very brilliant uh, panelists, where do we go from here? And what questions do we have that still needs more elucidation? And what are your reflections? But as for me, this is my reflection. I thank Louise and Martha first you know, for walking us through and helping us uncover the implicit, the hidden, the revised, and the unheard. The blurred aspects of history and the suppressed yet powerful voices of women who actually are among our sheroes, sources of inspirations, and reasons why we're all here, to, here today. Well, as a trans woman, as a trans Finai, a migrant, a person usually counted as part of the minority, the stories of Ida B. Wells, Mary McLeod Bethune, Fanny Lou Hammer, Shirley Chisholm, and even Dr. Mary Edwards, Walker, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are stories that I need to talk about further on. I need to make sure that they don't remain unheard in my classes and in my talks and hopefully in further research undertakings. Although some of the white suffragists have also behaved and accepted the systemic racism and played further roles in exacerbating the exclusion and marginalization of black women and perhaps men, and definitely uh, other people of color and ethnicities in their time, I want to acknowledge that in a few of them, they also carried a burden that in their time did not have the language and normativity in their cis and the heteronormative ways of living. Like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was among the first woman medical doctor and uh, a disciple of Amelia Bloomer, she defied the prevailing masculine domination in her or their little ways by wearing pants, by being quote unquote less feminine, by divorcing their husband after not taking his last name upon mar uh, marriage, 
lawyer and suffragist Gay Laughlin also defied the times by refusing to wear evening gowns without pockets. And I can only imagine how much courage it takes to defy the sartorial norms of those times that dictates everything about your comportment, personhood, and choices. Bell Squire, or Mrs. Bell Squire, was quoted that she would rather have a vote than a husband. Annie Tinker, who was described as mannish or sexual invert, which in those times were condescension and insults hurled towards those who we now lexically refer to as queer. Dr. Margaret Chung, whose parents are Chinese immigrants, and not only did she become a physician, but she also assumed the nickname of Mike and advocated for voting and inclusion of Asian Americans while wearing pants and that slick back hair. So there was a time where in some of the suffragists cohabited and had romantic or sexual relations, well, if not purely platonic. However, these relationships are sometimes referred to as Boston marriages, like that of Dr. Anna Howard Shaw and Lucy Anthony, who is the niece of Susan B. Anthony. Susan herself has had um, relationships and known to have expressed admirations you know, for other women suffragists. I can only imagine that it gets even more difficult if you are Black and queer. But still, it was known that Alice Dunbar Nelson, who is the widow of the great poet Paul, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, also had affairs with women, even after remarrying. The accomplished loose at any American university maintained a romantic relationship with poet and scholar Mary P. Burrell, who prior to Lucy also enamored another suffragist, Angelina Grimke of the Grimke sisters. This list could probably go on and on. And listening through the unheard, the queer aspects of the suffragists could come to light further. It is important to highlight that being queer was a reality in any timeline. And even among the unheard and suppressed Black women suffragists, there were queer among them. Although the suffrage movement predated the pathologization of gender and sexuality, even within the movement itself, it is not easy being queer. Black women bear the exclusion of the anti-suffragists and white suffragists, but queer suffragists themselves also live very suppressed lives. But we need to also talk about how the queering of the suffrage movement is actually a great source of change and power because being queer challenges everything that time, notion of family, chosen family, love, femininity, masculinity, and the status quo. Queer suffragists, mostly especially Black, Indigenous people of color suffragists, altogether transgress gender and sexual norms and ideologies and powerfully challenged the hegemony of patriarchy that at that, that time and this would eventually in some forms extend in different uh, countries. So whether you see it or not, the women suffragists inspired the other women and queer movements within this centennial period. So apart from the victory of um, Vice President Kamala Harris, the Black and queer suffragists fought hard so that we now welcome Sarah McBride, uh, the National Press Secretary for Human Rights Campaign, who is now the first trans woman senator in the United States. Maureen Turner won her ra their race as the first Muslim and first Black non-binary legislator in America. Stephanie Byers' victory in the 2020 election also made them the first openly trans person to serve in the Kansas legislature and the first trans Native American person, with them being a member of the Chickasaw Nation, and et cetera, et cetera. So we highlight these invisible and inaudible uh, voices, women and queer movers of the suffrage movement, who would much later on would also inspire the intersectional feminist movement, which hopefully we live by today. So with that, uh, thank you once more to our brilliant, powerful Shiro's today and Louise, Professor Louise Edwards. Don't forget, uh, there's Vanguard and there is um, um, Drawing Democratic Dreams in Republican China. And you could follow Martha and Louise in the, their respective um, social media platforms. If, if ever, you know, we would share them. Um, so thank you so much for having us. I'd like to thank our uh, department uh, ahead, Dr. Elizabeth Lacouture, for helping us uh, make, you know, for uh, allowing us to do this project. Professor Gina Marchetti, Professor Stacey Lee Ford, Professor Lee Chong, and most especially our dear Georgina Challen, also um, Raj Reyes, and to everyone who's joined us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.